And it took a couple of years and a lockdown. Always had a bit of an affinity for this part of the world. Always wanted to move and, and travel and live in this part of the world. Didn't know it was going to be El Salvador. So we had heard about what was going on in El Salvador. Grew more and more curious. When we came here at first, we weren't sure how long we were going to stay. We thought maybe it was just going to be for a couple of months before we went back to a different part of Mexico. Um, and then we got to El Zante and uh, here we are. It's been a year. We're live here from Bitcoin Beach. We have Kiki with us today. Um, it's another beautiful day here in El Zante, although it's Semana Santa, so that's Easter week, which is it's probably my least favorite <laughs> week of the, the year because everybody from the entire country comes to the coast. And, uh, you know, so it's just packed and, and you know, everybody's having fun, but uh, you're used to having the beach kind of to yourself. And so this week it's like, ah. So I don't know. Is this your first Semana Santa here? It's my first Semana Santa in Zante. Um, it's been officially a year this past weekend. And it's funny that you mentioned this because I've avoided coming down to the beach all week, which is not like me. Um, I've been here a year and I, I'm already feeling like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Friday Friday is kind of the crescendo. It, uh, it's the most packed Friday. And yeah. then it starts to mellow out by by Sunday. But Friday is the... The, the bigger holiday that they celebrate as far as the Easter week here. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit different, um, but excited to, to have an, another Canadian uh, <laughs> refugee here on the show. I think we've had uh, three or four already. It uh, seems to be a, a theme, uh, people wanting to get out of Canada. So tell us a little bit about your experience, um, you know, coming here from Canada how you were introduced to Bitcoin and how those things kind of came together to bring you here. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's kind of funny I, to be here and be surrounded by so many Canadians, um, but then also so many Canadians that represent what I grew up with knowing Canada was. Um, a little bit, I guess, about how I ended up here. Uh, I've, I've Canadian through and through, born and raised, um, always had a bit of an affinity for this part of the world always wanted to move and, and travel and live in this part of the world. Didn't know it was going to be El Salvador. Didn't know when or how it was going to happen. Uh, my background professionally is all working in restaurants, which um, is a great experience, but it definitely like kept me tied to Toronto, where I'm from. Um, and I remember thinking my last trip to Mexico before I had moved, I really want to make this happen. I have no idea how it's going to happen. And it took a couple of years and a lockdown <laughs> in order for it to happen. But I, I definitely feel like one of the people who um, very much is like grateful for everything that's that's happened in, in my life for the past three years. We actually went, my boyfriend and I, who's Australian, um, we went to Oaxaca, Mexico for six months before we came to El Salvador. Um, beautiful place, great food. Uh, but we didn't find any community. You know, there wasn't, we certainly didn't find any Bitcoiners, um, but there wasn't a whole lot of like freedom mindedness. Um, I think that that part of, of Mexico has a lot of other things going on right now that they need to focus on. Um, so we had heard about what was going on in El Salvador, grew more and more curious. When we came here at first, we weren't sure how long we were gonna stay. We thought maybe it was just gonna be for a couple of months before we went back to a different part of Mexico. Um, and then we got to El Zante and uh, here we are. It's been a year. <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing for how many people COVID, not that it was like a good thing, but it shook them out of their routine. And for the first time, they're like, we don't have to live like this. We can. And a lot of them, you know, especially coming from places like Canada or Australia, where they saw uh, the, their government's you know, true intentions kind of rise to the surface it kind of was a wake-up call of hey we need to look for something different so yeah um but a lot of times those are good things they sh they get us on the path that we're supposed to be on and um it's funny because a lot of people i've talked to that are here now their first stop was mexico i think for a lot of people that's like the yeah. first intuition is 
let's head to Mexico. I, I think Mexico didn't really lock down during COVID, so it was a welcoming place. And then, but a lot of them, like you said, they just don't really find their place and, the, and their people, and then they wind up going further south, so. Yeah, it was funny when we first got here too from from Mexico, specifically from the south. I, I don't know, I just thought that the culture was going to be so similar. And then we got here and I was like, oh, wow, this is totally different than what I was expecting. Um, and it, for the better, um, I think that. What What are some specific things you would say that kind of jumped out at you that were different than you expected? Honestly, I think the biggest thing, and you probably hear this time and time again, but like the people. Um, the communities here, uh, hardworking, humble, so, so, so welcoming, like people you have never met before. Every day you pass by somebody on the street, they say hello to you. They look you in the eye. Um, you're made to feel very welcome here. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what, like, that's why a lot of people end up staying here after coming here and, and <laughs> experiencing what it's like. It's funny you mentioned that because when we, when I first came here, it was about 20 years ago and had amazing surf, amazing time, but that was what stuck out to me was the people. They were like so friendly, but not, not in a way like they're trying to sell something to you or get something from you, just in a real genuine like, hey, welcome, anything we can do for you. I mean, it was just, uh, you immediately felt like you were with family. So yeah. it really, and I think almost everybody I talked to has that same experience. It's funny, I, I was thinking about this last week, there's like, definitely an element of, of pride for their country and their family, but it's not in a, an obnoxious way. It's very much like we want to share what what our traditions are, what our family is like, what our country is like. Um, and you see it time and time again, no matter where you are in the country. Um, it's not, it doesn't change, that part doesn't change. People are just, I feel like if, I, if something were to happen, I know that there are many, many people who would be willing and ready to help. Um, and that's, I think, just like speaks to why people come here and stay here. Definitely. Yeah. No, you feel like if you broke down on the side of the road somewhere or just needed help moving something, you know, somebody just you don't even know is going to offer to help. Yeah. So. And, and that was something that like that was what kind of drove us to consider leaving Toronto in the first place is it got to a point where you would be walking down the, the street with somebody coming you know facing you and they would cross to go to the other side of the road they wouldn't look at you they would cross it was like it, it just became this hostile environment um and then you come here and you're like wow this is what it used to be like this is what life is supposed to be like this is what community yeah. feels like you know um yeah. no it's it's hard for people to really understand that without visiting here and kind of feeling it but you hear that same thing from from everybody that sense of even though you're in a foreign place, you feel more welcome and mm -hmm. accepted. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. um, yeah. How, how did Bitcoin enter your life? Because on the way over here, we're talking, you weren't like a lifetime Bitcoiner. <laughs> nope. This was something that's relatively new for you. So yeah. tell us your Bitcoin story. Yeah, it's funny because in a way, I like, I like to <laughs> refer to myself as born again <laughs> because myself three four years ago totally different like different ideology different goals in life um just a different perspective and like i said i do feel grateful because i have gotten to take the past couple of years to reevaluate what i wanted um my boyfriend was a bitcoiner when i met him didn't really know much about it i remember did you think that was weird like what's this weird bitcoin <laughs> cult that you're in or it, i didn't at the time because he ha hadn't quite gotten to well Frankly, he hadn't found Bitcoin Twitter yet. He was a okay. Bitcoiner, but he hadn't found Bitcoin <laughs> Twitter yet. <laughs> um, it was something that he like spoke about a little bit, but not much. I think he was still in the beginning of his journey as well. Um, and I remember one day I, we were taking the subway home and I said, so what is Bitcoin? And I know exactly, like I could pinpoint it on a map exactly where we were because it was a pivotal moment. And he just went, oh, wow. And his eyes lit up and he started telling me about this, this whole thing. And, and then... Oh gosh, like maybe four weeks later, we're locked down in, in an apartment. <laughs> and what do we have to do? We have YouTube videos to watch. Um, so I slowly kind of started the journey there. Um, but then I realized in true Bitcoin fashion, nobody can do the work for you. Um, and I ended up, of course, reading the Bitcoin standard. Obviously, it's the, the most convincing, <laughs> compelling argument. Um, and my background is all in restaurants. So the, I guess, kind of 
fiat food or, or sound food part of that is what really, I guess, solidified all of the, everything that Saifedean was talking about for me. And it still continues to be, I think, one of the um, most, one of the things that I find my niche in within the Bitcoin community. So that's what brought me into Bitcoin. Um, and then as I watched the decline of my country <laughs> and realized that there was maybe a lifeboat, like there was maybe a little bit of hope somewhere out there um, and kind of went on a, a pilgrimage, if you will, to find it, ended up here. And and this is where things like the proof is in the pudding here. You know what I mean? You get to see it every day. Um, yeah, it, it's not perfect every time you go to use it. That's part of the process. Um, but be, to be able to be here and, and interact on a daily basis and see the lives of people that it's helping, not just like from my Canadian or Western North American perspective, but like in a real world application, it's undeniable. You can't, you can't unsee it. I'm, uh, super excited. I, I heard that Saifedean is going to be here next month, so I'm going to try to wrangle him, get him in here on the podcast. But it's, it's fun seeing all these, you know, Bitcoiners that, that you look up to and admire. They're, <laughs> they're all making their, you know, sojourn to, yeah. to El Salvador. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a fun place to be. You feel like you're, you know, I've, I've said this a million times, but you feel like you're in the middle of a Bitcoin conference nonstop. I mean, it's just interesting people that you connect with on all these different levels are, are you know, living around you or traveling through. And so it just, yeah, it feels like this is such an exciting place to live. I don't know if you feel like that at all. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. There's, it, I think what's so cool about it too is everybody has like their own story, their own perspective, their own like niche in the space as well. And to be able to actually sit down with people and like have a barbecue and eat a like barbecued steak and talk about what brought them to Bitcoin and and have some things that are in common, but maybe some things that are a little bit different from whatever country that they're from. And um, there's uh, so much hope and also just so much uh, like sharing of, of ideas and, and thoughts. And I think one of the things that I've learned is it's a great place to like really kind of dip your toes in and put yourself out there and meet other people. I think there's so many people who feel, even though they have Bitcoin or maybe the Bitcoin Twitter or whatever it is, um, it can still feel isolating if you're living in a place where you're not surrounded by that and coming here and it, like, it, it's just every day, it just becomes normal. It's like, it's life-changing for sure. And I think for you, um, kind of diving in and, and volunteering, and helping at Hope House has been a big part of that journey. Connected you with the local people, but also with other Bitcoiners. And that's the question we get from people all the time is, how can I come down and volunteer? What can I do? And you know, sometimes it's hard because people are here for a very short time and it's it's hard to find a mean, something meaningful for them to do. But the people like you that are make the commitment, that are living here, usually find their little niche where they can give back and be a part. So I'd love to hear just from your perspective, what you see happening at Hope House, how you see it impacting the community and what parts you participate in, but also just what you're most excited about. Yeah, um, and it's funny to, to like open that up a little bit and <laughs> what you were saying about meeting so many people that you see on Twitter or wherever else. I remember the day that I met Chimbera. <laughs> And I, I really, I'd seen him, you know, in so many videos and talking about Hope House and um, all of a sudden one day he's like just ch talking with a friend of mine. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Chimbera. I can't believe it. And and now he's like a neighbor and I get to spend as much time with him as he lets me. <laughs> um, but he invited uh, my boyfriend and I to come to uh, Sir Peritotos, of course, um, a couple of times. And uh, I we were staying very close to Hope House for a little while, so it was it was just convenient. Um, but it was really important when we moved here that we we wanted to really get to know the community. And I think that that's such a great way that we've been able to do that. Um, and just to clarify for people, yeah. you weren't a surfer prior uh -uh. to that. You didn't need some <laughs> no skill <way>. level or something <laughs> to help with this. No way. And honestly, my Spanish was horrible <laughs> and it's still not that great. But, um, you know, they're kids. They they welcome you with open arms and they giggle and they yell and they scream and they're going to do that, you know, whether you speak English or French or Spanish or whatever language you speak. And um, I just think it, you can see like the their eyes light up when new people come and join 
the groups and interact with them. And um, I had a friend come visit me from Toronto for a couple of weeks and he came to one and it was just a great experience for the kids and for him. Um, it really doesn't take much. The, the Hope House doesn't ask much. You just show up and enjoy the time that you have there. You don't need to be a surfer, nothing like that. Um, it, it seems so simple, but it really does make a difference. And when you, after doing it a couple of times and you walk around town and you realize, oh, that's the kid that I was playing soccer with on Saturday and he's with his family and they're having dinner at the pupuseria and, you know, being able to like smile and, and genuinely make these connections with people, it, it goes a long way for sure. And I think you've done, gone for some of the school visits too, where they're doing the Bitcoin education, right? Yes. I, I saw some. Andy, do we have those, any of those pictures um, from, from Hope House in general or from the school we can throw up there on the screen? Yeah, that was really fun too. Um, it's been, oh yes. This so this is, is a surf for total, right? This is yeah. surf for, this is actually on my birthday. <laughs> um, <laughs> they threw me up in the air a million times. Um, one of the cool things about this actually, they sang happy birthday to me in like six different languages. <laughs> Just because that's how many different, you know, expats yeah. and people of different backgrounds are around. Um, that was a really, really fun time. I feel bad for them, kind of. <laughs> like I'm, I'm a grown woman. <laughs> uh, they, they, they look like they're having fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a good time. So you usually do that on Saturdays. That Saturday mornings, okay. eight a.m. Um, it's funny because it, you know sometimes I'm like eight a.m. Saturday morning, really, but I have never, ever, ever once regretted waking up and going. Sometimes it's a bit of a slow crawl. I might yeah. need to have a coffee when I get there, but it's so worth it. Like the, it's fun and it really does mean a lot to the, the community, I think. So, yeah. And then do, we have, do we have any of the school ones in there? Yeah. So this is um, uh, one of the high schools close by actually. And we got to go speak about our kind of experience, like how we ended up here, of course. Um, but then also help some of the kids download Bitcoin Beach Wallet, now Blink, <laughs> and uh, send them some sats. That was really fun. It was really cool to see them be so interested in something that they knew a little bit about, but not yeah. enough, you know? Um, and also, like, this particular experience was interesting because it was myself, my Australian boyfriend. There was another Aussie guy, another Canadian guy, and then a Polish guy from Sweden or something like that. So... Uh, sometimes I think about it from their perspective, like all of these people from all over the world just showing up, like it's so cool. It's amazing. Yeah, that is us sending some sats. You can see they're a little bit confused also because I'm trying to explain it in my limited <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> but we, we made it through. Bitcoin is the language of the people, yes, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's the group of us in the high school. It was a great time. That's so great. Mm -hmm. So, and and how much of a time commitment has that, um, have you needed to make in order to, to participate in the Hope House things? Just to give people listening, you know, some sense of, hey, if I go down, maybe they're working full time. Mm -hmm. Can they still be involved in these things? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I work full time as well remotely. Um, I spend most of my Saturdays with Hope House. We do surf Todos in the morning and then we have a little soccer class in the afternoon. Um, there's 10, 15 kids. Um, so that's most of my Saturdays. Uh, but I mean, it's really like, it's what you make it. You know what I mean? You can be as involved as you want to be. Um, I don't think they're ever gonna say, no, you need to go home. We don't want you here. You know what I mean? Um, in terms of like the the school visits, those are a little bit more of a weekday thing. I think this one I had a couple of days notice to do. Um, but it, like I said, it's it's really what you make of it. And there's lots of opportunity to even just be there and show up and, you know, English class graduations, go yeah. and support them and then have a conversation with them afterwards. That's that's what we did. And we've been able to meet people because of that. Um, people who work at local restaurants and then you go to the restaurant and you say, hi, how are you? They get to practice their, their English. It's yeah. Yeah. Especially with the English classes, a lot of times, even if you're only here for a week, you can pop in and be there for the week because, mm -hmm. you know, they want to have somebody that speaks English as their first language just for them to practice with. So. And I have to say, I've like peeked in on a couple classes, went to a couple graduations. The, the teacher is incredible. And these kids, oh, 
I'm inspired every time I hear them go up on the microphone and and talk in English because I'm like, man, I've been trying to learn Spanish for two <laughs> years and I can't do what they're doing right now. Well, I'm glad it's not just me <laughs> because I've been here for almost 20 years now and and I'm like, oh my gosh, pretty soon their English is going to be better than my Spanish. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. It's some 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 benefit to learning when you're younger. Yeah, and that's the other cool thing too is I, there's actually like one family in particular that comes to mind. It, it's something that is applicable to everybody. Just like Surfer Todos, it's Surfer is a, for everybody, right? There's a family, a local family where the daughter takes English classes and then the parents also take English classes. And then they, I was talking to the daughter the other day and they get to like practice their English together. And it's just how, what a great environment to, to be in and, and to have that available to you, you know? Well, it's amazing how many doors that opens too. I heard so many testimonies from people mm -hmm. about how it led to a better paying job or even for travel for some of them. And so, um, yeah, especially with the work world changing and all these remote jobs now being available, they no longer have to leave El Salvador to be able to work for these international companies. And yeah. pretty soon, the, the international companies will be based here anyway, so it won't matter <laughs> yeah. the way things are going. But um, for but sure. for, for now, during that kind of transition time, they're able to get these better paying jobs, you know, working around the world. And so you, you bring up remote work, mm -hmm. and so I'd love to hear you know, what your journey was. Um, I know you worked in food service, so I'm assuming that wasn't remote uh, <laughs> pre-COVID. And a lot of people feel like that's holding them back. Like, I would love to move to El Salvador. I would love to do this, but I can't because I need to work. They have maybe in their mind that everybody who comes to El Salvador are wealthy Bitcoiners that, you know, just have all this money and they don't need to work, which is like a very, very, very small proportion of yeah. the people actually here. Almost everybody's working. So yeah. I think for a lot of people that can, you know, give them some hope of, wow, I could do this same thing if I'm willing to, to you know, make that jump. So tell us how, how that transpired for you. Yeah. And I think I alluded to it uh, a little bit earlier. I, as you mentioned, I, my whole professional experience, including like my college experience was restaurants and it was specifically managing restaurants from a front of house perspective, serving, bartending, that sort of thing. And I loved it, truthfully. Um, and I, I kind of did hold that in my past as a, how am I going to be able to travel the world if I am working in restaurants? Um, for me, uh, what ended up happening is I transitioned into working for a restaurant technology company um, online, specifically in sales, um, which I like in hindsight, it was like so obvious that that was the path that could be laid out for me. Um, but that was that really was the the uh, that came from networking and that came from looking at my peers around me who were at one point in my position of having this restaurant experience, not knowing what to do with it and how they ended up doing what they wanted to do. So I think when it comes to like remote work or feeling like you might not have uh, the, the chance in whatever industry it is. Oh man, technology is moving so quickly. Like there are jobs out there. There are many, many jobs out there. Speak to people, you know, ask around, find people who, who were doing what you were doing before and ask them how they got to their, their specific place. Right. Um, in terms of like remotely working here in El Salvador, I mean, even coming to El Salvador and networking here is a great place. I mean, I have met people in, in all sorts of positions who are working remotely, including like very high up in some really, you know, prominent tech companies. So even if that's like your goal, come here, network and meet people. Absolutely. There's plenty of opportunity to do that here. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious for you and your own journey. Uh, originally it, you weren't looking for remote to, to travel or were you, was that the, the objective? Well, I, we were locked down and I spent over a year taking restaurant takeout orders from one platform and punching them into another platform. And I thought, I can't do this for the rest of my life. Um, and then as I saw kind of the changes that were going on in Canada, I also thought I can't do this for the rest of my life. So in a way, there was a little bit of an exit strategy long term being looked at there. Um, but I didn't necessarily get this job thinking that I was going to leave immediately. It was when Trudeau made the announcement that we weren't going to be able to travel within the country without being vaccinated. And for me, like my half of my family lives on the opposite side of the country that I was in. Um, 
that was when I was like, okay, things are starting to get serious. It's, it's go time. And my boyfriend was like, we got to go, we got to get out of here. And we couldn't go back to Australia. That's for damn sure. (laughs) Um, and I had already laid the groundwork knowing that this day might come in the future. Um, so it wasn't necessarily like I got a remote job specifically so I could move. Um, it was, I'm getting a remote job to insulate myself from the, from the things that might come up in the future. And it just so happened that it did work out. Um, when I left, I went to my company that I'd only been with for about three months and I said, Hey, it's been a really great time. Uh, I hope things are going well, but I'm leaving and I hope that's not going to be an issue. (laughs) And it ended up uh, mostly not being issue for most of the time. Um, and now I've got a little bit of experience under my belt and sometimes it's, I kind of think of it like remote work the same way that I think about working in restaurants. Sometimes you've got to, you know, settle for something. Um, and get a little bit of experience under yeah. your belt before you do like, you know, move on up to exactly where you want to be. But that comes back to the Bitcoin low time preference perspective. You know what I mean? Sometimes you do have to sacrifice a little bit in the short term to to get what you're really looking for out of life. And how has it been for you working remotely in El Salvador? With, has the Internet been fine? The the work environment? How you do you go to one of the co-working spaces, the restaurants, you working out of your home? Yeah. What's a day look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the biggest problem with working remotely in El Salvador is you want to go experience El Salvador <laughs> for most of your time, <laughs> um, especially if you live in Zanse and you want to learn to surf or something like that. So there's like definitely an element of, of time management there. But for the most part, the Internet is good. Um, I think it's getting even the infrastructure is getting better in Zanse and in the Surf City area. Um, you do like in my experience there have been like random cases you know a car runs into a pole like nobody can predict that so you have a backup of your your hotspot on your phone or maybe a battery pack just in case um but i haven't had any serious issues that have actually affected my my work in any way um it's just about being prepared um, and then I think also like, yes, I just made that joke about wanting to go and enjoy El Salvador, but there's something to be said about the work-life balance that you get to have when you're working remotely. It's definitely in your hands and you have to um, remain disciplined in and of yourself. But if you even can just like set aside some space, a desk or something like that, or um, in the event of people who are able to work in co-working spaces or at restaurants and go and do that and then have the rest of your your day and your life to to experience this country and everything that it has to offer, like I, I that I can't imagine a, a better <laughs> thing to be doing. I, I think it's a little bit more motivational to, to get out and see the sunset when it's beautiful weather and so amazing. If you're in Canada in the middle of, of winter, maybe mm-hmm. you just keep working through that. So I do think it really pushes people to have you know a better work-life balance. And, and I've had a lot of people say that they're just much more healthy here. Their routines are more healthy. They're working out more. They're eating better. They're in, enjoying themselves a lot more. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned the routine thing because I didn't realize this. I guess I just hadn't thought of it, but um, the sun rises relatively at the same time throughout the entire year and sets relatively at the same time throughout the entire year. I'm used to a three to four hour difference depending on the time of year where I come from. Um, But in a way like, yeah, you definitely do learn to appreciate your routine a little bit more. Like people are up and going to work at 6 a.m. They are on their way to work at 6 a.m. here. <laughs> um, and things get, you know, it, it does quiet down a little bit in the evenings earlier than I am used to. And again, my background is in restaurants. So there was a time in my life I was going to bed consistently at 3 a.m. <laughs> That's not really the case here. You know, even if you wanted to, it, it would be pretty hard. Yeah. You'd be pretty lonely. Um, but it does speak to like the ultimate kind of idea of this is a, a very healthy place to live. And and when you do kind of start to understand and be involved in the community, that, that progression happens naturally, I would say. Um, yeah. So for the, the viewers and listeners, I would love to delve into just a little bit of the nuts and bolts of how you landed in El Zante, what it was like finding housing, you know, how do you get around those just sorts of practical things that people are always asking me, you know, <laughs> and so I and and some sometimes, you know, I've been here forever. And so I'm probably not the best person to ask because I have my own routines that maybe aren't normal. And so to, to have somebody that's come, you know, more recently, mm-hmm. I would love to hear, did you know you were going to be in El Zante originally? Did you 
go to San Salvador at all? Did you look at other beach towns? What was your kind of journey to get here? Yeah, um, I we actually went and stayed for three weeks in San Salvador when we first got here. Um, I think just really not knowing what to do. Because and, and where in San Salvador? Were Antigua, you? Cuscatlan, okay, uh -huh. um, which is a really nice area. And our, our Airbnb was great. It had a lime tree in the back um, yard, which at the time I thought was just like the most novel thing ever. And then I come down here and I'm like, oh, there's lime trees everywhere. OK, I get it. <laughs> um, but it, it it wasn't. To be honest with you, like it wasn't what we were looking for. We saw these pictures and videos of Zante in the beach area and we stayed in the city. And um, part of the reason for leaving Toronto was because we wanted to get out of that city life and we just we weren't sure what to do. So we ended up there. Um, it wasn't that it was bad. It just wasn't what we were looking for. So we ended up finding a place to stay in um, a nearby community to here. And uh, that was also good. But we don't drive and it was one of the like gated communities where you really do kind of need a car to go back and forth to the grocery store, that sort of thing. There was one tienda in the area and one um, restaurant. So again, good, but we got a glimpse of the beach life. Yeah. <laughs> and then we started coming here for meetups and surf Fair Todos, met Chambera, met a bunch of other just plebs in the community. and. Um, it took a while to really find a place that we felt comfortable in long term. There is there is a lot of places to rent, whether it's short term, long term, no matter what your budget is. But you there is an element of like, as I was saying to you earlier, proof of work, like you kind of have to be here to find them at this point. And I think that that's it seems like that's going to get better. Like there is a lot of development going on. There's more and more people who are willing to share their experiences here. Um, but we bounced around. I think we stayed in five different places last year in El Salvador before we found the place that we found. And um, I'm glad that we went through that experience because we ended up with the best place we possibly could have asked for. Um, so, in and, and just as far as range of what people should should budget, because, you know, a lot, sometimes people come down and they expect everything to be super cheap. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you know, especially accommodations in El Zante, you can spend quite a bit, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the location and the amount of work and research you do yeah. into it. So what what should people expect? And and also, what does that mean? You know, obviously, it's, you know, difference between staying in, you know, a block wall place without air conditioning versus, you know, a nicely furnished place. So Yeah. Um, and it's funny that you asked that, too, because when we were looking for our long term place, we saw the entire spectrum. We did see one apartment that was two hundred dollars a month. Um, there was nothing in it. It looked like it hadn't been swept in two years. <laughs> so if you're really on a budget, there are options. I wouldn't recommend them. Um, yeah, I think that there is an element of uh, accommodations are more expensive than we were expecting. They're definitely more expensive than we were paying in Mexico. Um, but it's there's trade offs to everything. Yeah. Right. Um, and it does also depend on what lifestyle, what you're you want, what what you're willing to sacrifice. I think if you're like a solo person, um, it's a little bit easier, to be honest. The thing is, is like there's a lot of hostels that have shared accommodations or a room with shared areas. And then there's the higher end hotels or bigger like ranchos, if you will, with multiple bedrooms. It's hard to find something that's in the middle. Um, but there are places. And I think from what I've seen is like being here, boots on the ground, speaking to people, I mean, I have a friend who found their their long term stay just by walking around, knocking on doors. <laughs> you know what I mean? Speaking um, to the locals, and that's how we found our place too is is through a local connection. So, um, so I, for like a two bedroom, one bath, you know, moderately, you know, moderate level, you know, with air conditioning, what what would people look to budget for? I mean, I feel like, and this is just what I've seen in my experience. I feel like a thousand and it's funny because i'm canadian so i have to go back and forth still all the time but i feel like a thousand is a thousand to fifteen hundred is, is in u.s reasonable in u.s dollars uh -huh. um there's really nice places that are more than that there's less nice places less refined places if you will that are cheaper but like when i look at our accommodations that's about what we're paying in that like 1200 for the space that we have um, and does that include any utilities or are you paying those separate or for us we pay them separately okay um and so that's water that's electricity um we also i i put my foot down and i had to have a washing machine 
<laughs> I hand washed my clothes for six months. And I said, I, you know what? I don't care how much it costs me in water. I need a washing machine. So our bills are probably a little bit higher than the average person. But for example, like uh, we have unlimited internet that's pretty reliable and that's $40 a month. For me coming from Canada, that's like a dream. You know, the, your, our cell phone is $15 a month. In Canada, it's 150 to 250 a month. So like I said, there's kind of trade-offs to everything. Um, but, but what's your electric bill run? It's about, it depends on how much we're using the AC. Yeah. And April, March has been, March was really hot. I'm sure April and May are about to be really hot too. So uh, like at the max, no more than $200. Um, and that's like two ACs in our house, one in the office, one in a bedroom. Um, and we have a lot of computers, yeah. node, that yeah. sort of thing, right? You can keep, you can bring that number down if you're a little bit more cognizant yeah. of it, yeah. for sure. No, but I think that's a pretty middle of the road budget for, you know, people that are working in online jobs. Yeah. Um, and you can live comfortably on that. Yeah. And so you said you think it's, it's, significantly more expensive than Mexico or moderately? Moderately. Or, okay. Moderately. And it depends on like if we're, if we're speaking specifically to Mexico, it depends on what area of Mexico. Yeah, too. Like yeah. I was in Oaxaca, which is um, one of the poor areas of Mexico. So we were our rent there was very, very low um, versus maybe if you were coming from like Playa del Carmen or Sayulita. Sayulita is crazy expensive, that sort of thing. Um, overall, I would say my lifestyle here is better and less expensive than my lifestyle is living in Canada, for sure. Um, we don't drive, so that's one thing that like I can't speak to, but the bus system here is pretty good. $1.50 for an air conditioned bus or 50 cents for uh, a regular bus, and that's just like a whole cultural experience in and of itself that never had a bad experience, so I'll always recommend that to people as well. Have, have you been able to figure out the schedule? I no. could never figure out. I don't think anyone How has. do you know <laughs> when to be where? You just go stand out there and well, there's hope like, you get on the right bus? Yeah, there's definitely the, the, the little bus stop area and entrance to, I guess it would be, in Zante. Um, we only ever take the 102 bus. Uh, okay, so you know which one you're looking for. We know for. which one we're looking for, um, but I've also just like, waved it down off of the side of the road. Um, you know, you, you kind of have to wave like a maniac and maybe jump around a little bit. But I've also had really bad experiences, unfortunately, where like the bus has been really full and two buses have passed me and we've been waiting over an hour. So yeah. is it the most reliable if like you have a meeting to be at at 1030? Maybe not, but that's part of the whole kind of process of, of coming here and, and getting to know what life here is like. Like, it's like I said, it's proof of work a little bit. <laughs> and do you guys take Ubers ever or how have you found those to be in El Zante? I've heard mixed things that sometimes you can get them and sometimes you can't. Yeah, we we tried it once. It didn't work okay. out. I think we waited 30 minutes or something like that and it didn't work. I, I know that there are every once in a while someone is able to get one, um, but we have relied on relationships with drivers. Um, yeah all of which take Bitcoin, I will also say, and all of which are lovely and have gone above and beyond for us. Like there was one time I was quite sick last summer and I called her driver and I said, hey, I don't know what to do. I'm really sick. Like, can you help? And he called the hospital to make sure that they were open, find out what the consultation fee was going to be, drove from the city to Zante to pick me up, drove us to the doctor, while I was at the doctor, took my boyfriend to the mall, came back, picked me up, brought me to the mall, and then back to Zante. And it's like, that goes back to what I was saying about these people will literally, like they are so, so helpful and welcoming and friendly. And um, so if you can find, I think that's like a big, a really good tip for people who are coming here and looking to stay long-term. If you can find somebody in that capacity that you can rely on, that that's huge. That's been really yeah. helpful for us. And do you guys have, plans to get a vehicle or do you think you'll just live here without a vehicle or what's the what's we definitely the yeah we definitely have plans to get a vehicle um in speaking of expenses i think that's one thing that really did shock us uh i wasn't expecting a 2001 like toyota to be upwards of ten thousand dollars us but they hold their value here yeah. it makes sense especially the toyotas especially the toyotas yeah, yeah. Um, but considering so much of, of the, the country, aside from like 
the beach highway here is only accessible by four by four. I think for us, it's like if we're going to get a vehicle, it makes sense to be able to access wherever we want to go. Um, and it seems like there just isn't enough supply for the demand that's there. Yeah. So it's a bit of an investment. But I think if like you're looking to stay here long term, it makes sense. We had a scooter for a while. That was fun. Um, but it, you can't like do groceries as two people on it. So. Yeah. <laughs> as much as we tried and we sure did try. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Car cars here are, it is something that can be a little challenging. I've found that, um, yeah, like you were saying, they just hold their value so well that it's, you're looking at this used vehicle and it's like, so we've actually gone to buying new vehicles, which I wouldn't do in the U S but here I'm like, even if we sell it in five years, we'll still get, you know, 75% yeah. of what we paid for it. And so yeah. sometimes it can be the better route, especially with the pickup trucks, yeah. the, the crew cab, four wheel drive pickup trucks. They're just like crazy. I think some of them now are worth more than when you bought them new. So. Uh, it's probably, yeah. And people sometimes say, you know, maybe it makes more sense to go to the US or to Canada, buy a car and, and drive it back. I mean, I haven't done it, but I've read that it's very um, inconsistent, like that whole process of uh, maybe border fees or whatever as you go through. So maybe one day, but I think for now it's just going to be bite the bullet. Yeah, I, w I would not recommend that route. No. I've heard <laughs> so many people spend so much time just trying to jump through the, yeah. the hoops. In fact, I bought a vehicle here from an American family that worked at the U.S. Embassy and they were leaving. And so I thought, well, it's already here. Everything's fine. But I didn't realize that when they bring it in through the embassy, they basically just give them temporary importing of that vehicle. Oh, geez. So I had to go through basically the process of importing, importing the vehicle. And it was, yeah. So now I'm like, no. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I think are, are, are really easy in this country, more easy than you yeah. expect, like visas, for yeah. example. Uh, but for some reason, cars just seem to be yeah. the bottleneck. Yeah. The, ve the vehicle thing uh, is, is a frustration for yeah, sure. Yeah. Somebody let Naive know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think too, as, as I mean, the country's so densely populated and as you know, the economy is growing and families can afford more that I True. think it's, I, I think they're, they're going to be a little bit restricted on just how many vehicles can fit inside the country. So that's true. It's uh, I've noticed yeah. the traffic's definitely picking up as the prosperity picks up. Are you sure that's not just the cows? Well, <laughs> sometimes it is the cows. Here for in sure. Zante. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That's, uh, that's for, for somebody who's visiting the first time and hasn't really traveled before. That's, they're always like, oh, there's cows in the road. You're like, yeah. Yes, yeah. that's, that's how they it's transport kind of the them from one place to another. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so you found your place. You guys are happy there. You're kind of have the uh, transportation aspect figured out. Yeah. How did you find the healthcare system? <laughs> I love this topic because I'm Canadian. And everyone says, "Oh, but you have free healthcare." Um, I have never been treated so well in uh, a healthcare establishment as I was here, and it was one experience. Um, so I, I can't speak for a whole lot of it, but it was quick, it was efficient, um, they were super friendly. Um, when we were having a little bit of translation issues, they were able to find somebody who spoke enough English to help us translate. Um, yeah, it it completely you know ruined everything that I thought about a healthcare system in the past <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I feel very lucky, like knowing that if I if for whatever reason I did need to access uh, the healthcare system in that capacity, it's there and it's available. I mean, I think like in the conversations I've had with locals, there are some levels to that. And yeah. that doesn't mean that every single person has the capability to go and spend fifteen dollars on a consultation, that sort of thing. But it seems to be that um, in general, it's a especially for people who are moving here, it's very accessible and affordable. And I think that will only continue to to, to grow and get better. Um, I mean, look at how like successful the Bitcoin dentist has been. How great is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, like, I think who, we'll see more and more of that. Here. I Like all of a sudden, all these adults just want to go to the dentist. <laughs> what happened there? Bitcoin. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Which, uh, what, did you go to the hospital or was it just the doctor's office? No, it was uh, one of the like family hospitals. Okay. Um, 
I don't recall the name of it. It was in the city. Um, yeah, I don't remember. Okay. The name. Yeah, we've had amazing care at the hospitals here. My kids have been for various things, and some of them, you know, fairly serious that required a few days stay. And yeah, it's like night and day difference between you know the U.S. They they come if you're a guest, they'll like make a bed for you and come ask you for your food order. I mean, it's just a in the U.S., it's like maybe they give you a little tiny chair to sit in the middle and you're probably in a shared room with somebody else. They asked me um, if I wanted a glass of water. Yeah. I was like, sure, that's so kind of you. <laughs> it's the little things. Yeah. But where I come from, like I remember the last um, time that I needed to use an Emerge in Canada. Um, it, I think I was waiting for like over six hours or something like that. It was just ridiculous. And and I have family members who have had serious health issues and um, they have to go to other parts of the country or they get put on a waiting list to be seen in six months, um, all because of our wonderful free healthcare system in Canada. And then, you know, that was one of my, like my family's biggest concerns when I was telling them I was coming here. Well, what about the healthcare system? And I'm like, that's the least of, of the concerns, yeah. you know? <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> no, when you show up to the hospital, they like, there's people there to bring you right in. Every time I had to take my kids, there's two nurses there, put them in a wheelchair, wheel them right in. We're seeing a doctor within like 20 minutes usually. Yeah. And for crazy cheap compared to the U.S. I mean, everything's going to seem cheap compared to the <laughs> U.S., but I'm always like shocked at how affordable the bill is. Now, granted, you know, I make a U.S. salary. I have a business in the U.S., that provides my finances. So that's not to say that everybody in El Salvador has access to this care. There is, there is care. There is, I think, um, care that everybody can access for free, but mm -hmm. those hospitals are obviously not nearly as nice as the private hospitals, but for expats that are coming are specifically worried about care that they can, you know, pay for. It's very affordable and, and very good. Yeah. And, At least that's been my experience so far. And it seems like there's a lot of um, expats uh, that are coming with medical backgrounds of other types. So I'm I'm certain that in the next in the coming years, there's going to be more and more healthcare of all kinds available. Like there's a couple of chiropractors, there's um, dentists, there's uh, a naturopath that I know of. Like there's there's lots of of people coming here with like solid skills and reliability yeah. and that sort of thing so I, that's only going to continue to grow i think no and i think the the government is really making an effort to incorporate you know all this talent from around the world into the system and you know make it so the licenses can pass over and i don't know the the specific details of what they need to do but it sounds like that's their goal where you know if a Somebody that practice medicine from somewhere else in the world tries to go to the U.S. It's a nightmare. I mean, they can almost never practice medicine in the U.S. without redoing everything. So it's great to see the government just using common sense in the way that they address things. Yeah. It's funny that you bring that up. The When we finally made the decision to leave, and I, it must have been, we maybe had a month of getting stuff together before we did leave Toronto. Um, we took a lot of Ubers and, and taxis and spoke to the taxi drivers um, and many of them were saying to us that you're making the right decision. And a lot of them said, I regret even coming here. Really? And I, you know, we would ask, say, why is that? Well, I came from, you know, this country. I thought that I was going to have uh, the Canadian dream. Um, I have a background in science and medicine in I, I talked to an astronaut one time. He's like, I can't, I can't do what I was trained to do here. And it, it, the only thing that like makes sense or that's lucrative for me is to drive an Uber. And it's like, what a fraud, <laughs> you know, I felt so deeply, I don't want to say sorry or like pity, but it was, it, it was just very eye opening that, um, that, that it's a waste happening. of their talents. It's a waste of their talent and it's a waste of government resources. Yeah. And it's just not, it doesn't, bide well for the the future of a country like that and then like you said you come here and people's backgrounds and their talents are actually being put to use and and celebrated and um explored as like legitimate as opposed to being you know oh here shuffle yourself right into the system and keep paying your taxes and everything's gonna be fine yeah know? so it sounds like you're kind of set that this is your home at least for the intermediate term 
what what has that meant for travel visas or just to let people know that are thinking about moving here? Um, I know for myself, for the first several years that we were here, we would just leave every 90 days um, to, to renew the visa because it was easier than going through the process. And, and we were actually spending a lot of time in the US, so we didn't technically qualify for that. And so I know a lot of people start out like that. I don't know if that's what you're doing or if you plan on getting residency or you know how, how you would advise people or yeah. what the things to look out for are. Yeah, and I think that that's like one of the things that when I speak to people on Twitter, and I'm sure you get this question all the time, what do I do about visas? I was talking to someone the other day and he said, once I get my visa situation sorted out, I can come down. And I said, what do you mean? Just come. <laughs> because it is, it's so much easier than, than we might think that it is. Um, when we first got here, it was the 90 days and then you could extend for another 90 days. Um, at the time, we, we decided to overstay. Um, and so when we left to do what we called a visa run at that time, there was a, a conversation uh, when we were leaving in the immigration, I guess, um, and we were fined $54, I think, each. Um, and they said, don't do it again. And we said, understood, uh, left, went to Mexico, came back, everything was fine. Um, when we got back, it was another 90 days. We did decide to do it right that time because we were at that point, we had decided we were going to pursue residency at some point. And um, although that option is available to you, like it, I wouldn't necessarily like I don't want to be the poster girl for that. I would yeah. recommend you yeah. everybody go and do it. Um, and now there's really no need, in my opinion. Um, so we went and did the extension. Uh, which was actually very painless, I will say. I thought it was going to be a little bit more paperwork, but we just had to write down why we wanted to stay. And I wrote Bitcoin and surfing and everything was fine. <laughs> um, the, the, one, the one thing I will tell people, you can't do that too early. We, yeah. we had to do that one time. And so I went a month ahead of time and they're like, uh -uh. no, you need to come like a day or two before. And I'm like, well, well, if you don't grant it, then I don't have tickets. They're like, no, we're going to grant it. You just do it a day or two before. So Yeah, it was funny because we had heard a couple of stories about that. And I, I actually ended up putting in a, in a calculator, what is five days before X date? Because we were arguing, is that date the fifth day or is that the sixth day? <laughs> Anyways, it ended up working out. They, they were understanding. Um, and then I had to go back to Toronto. Um, but in between the time that we got it extended and I had to go back to Toronto, uh, they announced 180 days. So that was exciting. Went back, came back through immigration, looked. I think he saw that I had been here a bunch and asked me a couple of questions. Where are you going? How long are you staying? Why are you here? Um, but again, pretty simple. Got 180 days. And, and with 180 days, you basically you do one trip a year yeah. and you're. Yeah. 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 And like there are don't get me wrong. I love it here. It's not to say that like you should leave here, but um, there are so many beautiful places around here. You know, I, I haven't been to um, Bitcoin Lake yet and I haven't been to Bitcoin Jungle yet, but they're very close. They're yeah. very easy to get to. And like, what a great kind of little <laughs> little corner of the world to live in if you want to do that kind of well, you like- You can be to Mexico City in a couple hours. Yeah. I mean, everything's right, yeah. right and here. This is a little hack, I will say. So there's no Amazon. As much as I, I hate Amazon, there is a benefit to it for sure. There's no Amazon in El Salvador. So what we have d done in the past is we go to Mexico City, make sure you get an Airbnb with an actual mailing address, get everything that you need <laughs> sent to you <laughs> where you're staying in Mexico City and bring it back with you. I brought half of a suitcase empty just to bring stuff back. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, I didn't. So it's pretty easy to get Amazon in Mexico City. Yeah, well, there's okay. Amazon Mexico. It's okay. great. I mean, again, I hate to say it. I'm not yeah. that person. but No, but there are certain things that you can't find anywhere else. Yeah. And it's just very convenient to to have. Yeah, we're, we're always jealous of the, the U.S. Embassy people because they have access to Amazon. The, the throw them on the planes that come down yeah. With, yeah, for them. And so I'm like, how did you get that? Oh, we ordered on Amazon. I'm like, oh, uh, yeah must be nice or you have to have like your friends who are coming set aside yeah. some space you got to organize it ahead of time <laughs> um but yeah there's definitely like it's it's it don't let i would say to people like don't let visas get in the way of, of coming here because it's really it's really not like the biggest concern i would say and when, when we were in mexico um 
there was a legitimate concern that if you get stopped in Mexico without your FMM at the time, your, your tourist visa there, that you could be deported or put in jail or bribed. We haven't had any of those issues or concerns here. We got, we haven't even been like, we were in a car that was pulled over once and it was a very like cordial, we're just pulling you over because we're at a checkpoint, like yeah. no issues yeah, yeah. thing. Like th that's really not something that I think people should be concerned about. Do it right. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. 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 Do it right. But also. Yeah. Obviously if you're doing something illegal, then you're going to yeah, have Yeah. Don't do illegal yeah. stuff. Yeah. I'm not here to say that. It's just like there are. Um, people are people are very like open and, and understanding and, and cooperative yeah no i've been here it's almost 20 years and i've never had the police once ask me for a bribe yeah which is it's pretty remarkable because yeah. you know just on you know any given trip to mexico or nicaragua i've had issues with that so yeah um yeah i think that's one thing that that makes you just feel more secure. You're not worried. Like when you see a police, it's a good thing. Not like, oh, the police are there. What are they going to try to get out of me? So Yeah. And, and yeah. they say hi to you on the road. Like it, it, yeah. you get to know the the faces. Like yeah. it's a completely different uh, experience than what people expect for sure. So how much of your life do you live on Bitcoin? Are you one of the Bitcoiners that never likes to, to spend any Bitcoin? Are you somebody who tries to do everything on Bitcoin? Do you just do whatever's most convenient at that time? And and how people always ask, well, how much life can you really live on Bitcoin? Like, do the stores really accept it? And it's such a nuanced thing. So I always like to hear other people say it because yeah. hear what their perspective is. Yeah. And it's a good question. Um, I mean, part of it for me is like also because I am working a, a fiat remote job, I'm being paid in fiat dollars. So that's a part of it. Um, in terms of when we first got here, uh, I I wasn't, to be honest, wasn't fully sold on selling Bitcoin or using Bitcoin as a method of like buying a coffee or whatever. Now I'm like all in because A, it's convenient and, and B, it just, it, it makes more sense. But um, I guess I've had to go through a little bit of a journey in that since getting here to now. And now I use Bitcoin as much as possible. Um, part of that is because I, it does help adoption, of course. Part of that is because I have Canadian dollars. So that's that. <laughs> Which, by the way, for Canadians, do not bring your Canadian dollars yeah. to El Salvador because, I mean, I had a, I knew a Canadian that attended the church we attend in San Salvador and he came to me, he's like, I have all these Canadian dollars and I can't find anybody that will exchange them. them. And yeah. I'm like, no, there's got to be places. And sure enough, there was none. The, we connected him with uh, um, El Dorado, the hotel here in El Zante that's run by Canadians and said, hey, can you help them? And they had, you know, some some people that were, you know, customers that were leaving, going back to Canada. And so they exchanged. But yeah, Canadian <laughs> dollars <funny>. are. <laughs> yeah, worthless. <laughs> um, but also just the friction of having to move between Canadian to U.S., et cetera, et cetera you know, Bitcoin just alleviates yeah. all of that. Um, so do you use that for your banking to bring funds? You know, obviously you're earning from a, uh, an international company. Are you now using Bitcoin as the way you fund your life? Like, is that? I would love to say 100% yes, but I would be lying. And the reason for that is um, there are times where, you know, you go to do your groceries and for whatever reason, I'm, I'm talking more work. about the actual bringing oh. funds into the country. Are you are you just pulling out of the ATM or yeah, are you no. using Bitcoin or how is that? Using Bitcoin almost exclusively okay. now. Um, again, like I said at the beginning, I, I was I just ha didn't have much practice and I thought that the other way was more convenient, probably out of laziness. But um, now it's almost exclusively through Bitcoin. Um, that having that even as an option in the first place is amazing because when I look back on it and the amount of time and money and, oh my gosh, calls to my Canadian banks that, that had to occur just for me to access my own freaking money. Because they've locked your account <laughs> up. Yeah. yeah. Always at the most inconvenient time. Yeah. I think it really took, there was a, a couple, um, like maybe three days in a row where I'd spent two plus hours on the phone with my bank all three days and I got to a point, I was like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this to myself? I have a better option. Why am I not using it? Um, so yeah, it's it's mostly mostly Bitcoin at this point. We we recently bought a, a truck for the, the project and the first dealer to start accepting Bitcoin. And it was just amazing how 
easy and frictionless it was where before it was getting a wire sent, it gets held up in the US, then it gets flagged here, then you know they want your tax returns, they want this, and it's like, it, you, it, it, sometimes you're like, I don't even, do we even need to buy it? Because it's not, <laughs> not even the money, just the hassle, hassle of actually making the transaction happen. But when they're like, oh, we'll take Bitcoin, it's like, oh, wow. Or when I'm watching people buy properties here, if the people don't accept Bitcoin, it's this drawn out, stressful thing. If they take Bitcoin, well, send the transaction, you watch it confirm and That's it's it. like done. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it makes uh, you wonder, like, what were you doing before all of this <laughs> and why wouldn't you use that for everything else moving forward? You know, well, and when you're forced to use it uh, last year, I, I had to send the wire down. We were, we were buying a vehicle and and they wouldn't accept Bitcoin. And I'm in the bank in the U.S. and like filling out all the wire instructions and they're asking, what's this for? And I happened to put the name of of uh jorge on it because he was going to be picking up the truck just so that they knew and then just because i'd put his name on that then they wanted all of his details and his id and his dewey number and all this stuff i'm like he's it's not his truck he's just picking it up they're like no it's on i mean it was you look at it you're like how is it 2000 it was 2022 at that time like how is it 2022 yeah. and we're still doing money like this <laughs> when you can zip anything else around the world yeah. digitally yeah. and we're doing this drawn out process that takes two weeks for an international wire and you know fifty dollars it's it's <laughs> absolutely insane and people are like oh bitcoin's too hard and confusing you're like oh yeah it is it's oh man yeah like i said it's like what was i doing for all that time because <laughs> the, the the answer is out there yeah you know we just have to start using it and sharing it with other people so they know how to use it as well what's well, funny too when you go other places you're so used to being able to to do things like that and then you're like oh wait i can't use bitcoin here and i didn't get any money oh <laughs> shoot i need the my credit cards expired you, you know you, yeah. you're like scrambling you're like ah it's so much easier in el salvador yeah and when I went back to Toronto, I, I had my wallet still loaded up and I had I didn't even think about it. I went to get a coffee and I was like, I don't have any cash with me. I didn't bring my wallet with me. I've just got my phone. My phone isn't connected to anything except for my Bitcoin wallet. Like, I guess I'm not getting a coffee today. <laughs> I'm back in Canada. <laughs> it's it, yeah, it's really quite, quite comical. And it's I think we have the privilege of like seeing the future and how it's all going to work. Yeah. And. Um, and that's when people ask, do you really think this is going to work? It's like, I, I don't think there's any way it doesn't. Yeah. It's just so much better in so many ways. All the just practical payment ways are so much better. Yeah. And and then, of course, the sound money is, you know, the takes it to another level. So it's like, how how does this not become the global currency? Yeah, it's like... It, 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 it's just like one of those things where you're not going to stop it. You know what I mean? It's either you, you, you're you getting on board or <laughs> you're just going to be like wondering why you weren't on board five years ago. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's funny when you have to go back, you you live here for a while and then you have to go back to that that other world out there. It's a bit jarring. It's almost like reverse culture shock in a way. <laughs> and I the thing that was really interesting to me about going back to was it made me really realize that like I see El Zante and El Salvador as home now. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm not like, I don't have full residency or anything in that sense yet, but um, I definitely see this as home. Um, and I feel so thankful <laughs> in order to say that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So what what would be just any advice, the things we haven't covered yet to, to people that are thinking about coming down here would you advise that they come visit first or just, hey, if you really think this is what you want, come stay for a month or what? Any other practical tips that you would give people? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's something to be said about like coming here to visit first and checking it out. Truthfully, like I said, that's what we tried to do. We just ended up staying and didn't have anywhere to go back to, right? We had all of our stuff in our three little suitcases. Um, but if you if you are curious, come and check it out for yourself. Like verify that this is exactly what you're hoping that it is and what you're looking for um don't be afraid to put yourself out there and whether it's messaging people on on twitter or whatever 
Nostra, whatever platform you're using, don't be afraid to message people. And when you get here, don't be afraid to introduce yourself to people. Um, I think that's what we, we've spoken about, how the community really is what makes this place so special. Um, but you do ha have to put yourself out there in order to be a part of it, right? Like, um, so be like be confident in yourself and, and know that like the, the community will embrace you. You just have to introduce yourself, you yeah. know? Um, I think a lot of the time people are a little bit scared about like their, their Spanish and I've mentioned it before. I've been practicing and learning Spanish for over two years now and it's still nowhere what I want it to be, but you're still gonna get by. Whether it's like using uh, a translation or, um, you know, lucking out and having someone who speaks English around you. Um, but it really does make a difference when you go and you try and communicate with locals in Spanish, no matter how bad it is. I think they they appreciate the the effort of trying. They're very gracious. They're very gracious. And you're also not going to get any better by like practicing on an app, talking into a robot. Like you're going to yeah. get better by practicing speaking with real people in the dialect, with the slang, with the speed. Like you just got to really put yourself out there um, and and know that like there is a, a big group of people that are ready to embrace you as part of our community as long as you're willing to to be a productive part of it right other than the the volunteering and, and the hope house activities where what else have you found that that allows you to kind of integrate are you i know there's a gym in town now yeah, um, that's exciting I, 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 I don't know if you were working out before you came over here or if you were just over there with Roman, but he's like, oh, we're over at the gym. And <laughs> I know that my wife was on her way to yoga class when we were coming over there that she goes and does at sunset. So there's a lot of activities like that. Are there specific things you would recommend to people to yeah. get involved in? Yeah, for sure. I think like if you're into yoga, there's a ton of yoga here. I've met people through just yoga specifically who have had a little bit of a, a Bitcoin seed planted, whether they were had that planted here or before as they were learning about here. So that's been really interesting. Um, tons of yoga, obviously a ton of surfing. Uh, I think surfing is pretty intimidating for most people when they first get into it. But um, there's a lot of people here who uh, love like kind of talking to beginners about it. So that's and a lot of way. great instructors and too that you can pay for classes for sure. Rent boards for sure. Um, surfing. Um, yeah, I, I like it sounds so silly, but literally just walking around and, and chatting with people. Uh, there is something about this place that makes people a little bit more relaxed, a little bit open to to chatting and talking. And um, you'd be surprised at how many people you can meet just by saying hello on the street. You know, um, there's a lot of Bitcoiners around. <laughs> it, it, a lot of them are wearing some sort of like low key Bitcoin swag in some way. You know, don't be afraid to introduce yourself to them. It, it's it's a very friendly and welcoming place and there's a lot going on um and like i said i think it's just about putting yourself out there trying something seeing what works any any negative things that that you think people should be aware of that like hey this is the reality or this is one downside of being here we just we always want to give people the broad yeah. picture so they're not blindsided by something yeah, for sure. I mean, we spoke about um, the transportation system, the bus yeah. system, for example. Like there, there is there is this part of moving here where you have to let go of some of the the conveniences of most of the places that people come here from. Um, some of that, a lot of the times, has to do with timing of certain things. Timing is not something that is like is like to the moment here. Um, but in a way, I think like if you look at that from the perspective of realizing that like people are happier here and and letting go of that it is uh, healthier overall um there's something to be said about that but it, it was very frustrating when i first got here trying to figure out the bus schedule you know trying to meet up with somebody and they're 30 minutes late that sort of thing um but it's part of it's part of the experience um aside from that i think one thing to to be aware of is like the food system here is not quite exactly like what I was used to at home. Um, it's not that there isn't food, it's just a lot of it. Is, if you go to like a mainstream grocery store or something like that, it's imported. Um, but that being said, there are people working to to change that. And I, I have a lot of hope for the food system growing in, in a much better kind of more local capacity moving yeah. forward. Um, yeah, I, it's one of those things you just gotta come and see for yourself. It sounds cliche, but it's true. You know, you've gotta verify it. No, that's what I always tell people. I'm like, I, I can explain, you know, 
for three hours, but <laughs> really, if you just spend a day here, you're going to learn so much more yeah. than, you know, all the different facts I can give you. Yeah. Um, what, what would you say to people about the, the weather? Do you, for, for me, sometimes it's a little warm this time of year. I'm starting to be like, uh, I think uh, tomorrow we're going to go escape to the mountains, the higher elevation, get a couple days of cooler weather. In general, I love the beach and love being here, but yeah. um, it's, you got to like warm weather if you're here. Uh, yeah. It's, oh, I mean, if you're in El Zonte, for sure. If, yeah. If yeah. you. The capital city, the yeah. weather's like ideal. Or the mountains, yeah. like you said, like there's a lot of the. I didn't realize how geographically diverse this country was as a whole until actually moving around in it. Um, so there's kind of in a way, it seems like anything that you're looking for, you can find in terms of El Zonte specifically. Yeah, it's it's hot uh, and we're currently in the hottest of yeah. it. <laughs> so you have to reconcile that. I mean, we were talking a little bit before about like people who are coming here and want to work. In a way, it does work out because you don't want to be in the sun and at peak sun in the middle of the day. But that's also, you know, the time that you're probably working anyways. So um, early sunset, both great times. Um, you, but in a way, you just get used to it as well. Like your yeah. body does um, acclimatize to, to the situation. That being said... Don't stand in in direct sunlight for two hours, <laughs> regardless of if you're wearing sunscreen or not, regardless of if you eat seed oils or not. It's just a bad idea. Like, just put a hat on or, yeah. or, or sit in a hammock or something. Don't, you're asking for it at that point. You, you know the people have been here for a while because you watch them walk down the street and they walk for the shade, like <laughs> uh, the crossover here to be in the shade, so. Yeah, it's so true. What, um, where can people find out more about you? Are you active on Twitter? Do you have a website or Instagram or what? Yeah. Where can people follow your, I don't know if you're putting your journey out that, there at all or, um, yeah. but how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, I'm sharing it a, a little bit more as I like get more comfortable in it. Um, on Twitter, I am at Bitcoin Babe E, B A B E Y. <laughs> and on Instagram, I'm at Casa Kakita. Um, I probably share a little bit more on Instagram. Sorry, it's the fiat in me. <laughs> it's the Toronto in me, probably. Um, but I, I do share a little bit about life in uh, El Salvador and El Zonte and um, just kind of what I've been up to. Um, and I'm always willing to speak to people who are curious, want to know more, are looking to, to move here because I remember coming here not knowing anyone and it, it was a little bit of a challenge. And um, I think it's like important to kind of pass that, that torch forward and, you know, bring more plebs. Yeah. Is there any projects or any other cool things other than, than Hope House that you'd want to shill and put out there of, hey, check this out. Um, we always want to promote other Bitcoiners and things that are happening. And so a lot of times I find about things first time asking okay. those questions. So, Interesting. Well, I yeah. know you just had Owen on. Yes, um, yes. Beef Back Better, that's like a huge, I'm so excited about that. I can't even tell you. Um, we could, I could sit here for another hour talking about that. But yeah, Beef Back Better. Um, I think that there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen in, in that kind of like food area and food space. Some things that I can't quite say yet, but there's a lot of cool stuff going well, on. Well, then you're going to have to come back we'll on come when back. you can tell us. <laughs> um, I know the having party is coming in 2024. Big Sean Harris, who was here. I met him here uh, in Zante last year. That's going to be uh, exciting. Um, oh man, like it's hard to keep up at this point. There's everybody's doing something and I'm like, who, who's doing what, what's happening this week? Uh, yeah. Beef back better is, is the one I'm going for. Are, are you on their list yet? Have you gotten any? I, I am. Okay. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to, to, uh, help Owen a little bit with what he's been working on. So I've, I've tried it. It's amazing. And even just having access to hundred percent grass fed. Yeah. Sovereign beef. Um, yeah, it's in cool. It's so cool. It's so exciting for me. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you spending uh, the afternoon uh, during Semana Santa uh, <laughs> with us here. And yeah. yeah, excited to have you back on when you can tell us more about whatever you <laughs> you have your fingers in the middle. Stay I always tuned. love to hear, you know, new things yeah. involved with the, the food side of things, because, you know, I, I come from a food background and as as Bitcoin becomes more and more important, important part of my life. I realize even some of those things, the the fiat part, as you described it. Mm -hmm. And so to see that not replicated here in El Salvador, but a, a more wholesome, you know, back to basics, you know, food 
pipeline yes. start to develop. So yeah. excited about that. So yeah, it's coming. You let us know when you're ready to share about that and we'll, <laughs> we'll have do. you back on. Love it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.